Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Georgia Lindsay, Senior Lecturer in Architecture and Design at the University of Tasmania. Welcome. I want to begin by recognizing the deep history and culture of the island. I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Palawa people of the land upon which this campus of the University of Tasmania was built. I pay my respects to elders past and present and to the many Aboriginal people that did not make elder status and to the Ab Tasmanian Aboriginal community that continue to care for country. Today, I am delighted to host the first of three panels celebrating the publishing of Contemporary Museum Architecture and Design, Theory and Practice of Place, where the authors who contributed chapters will overview their work and take questions. The four scholars speaking today, Matt Patterson, Shoshana, Shoshana B.D. Goldberg Miller, Jade Polizzi, and Helen Nori, all wrote about the experience of museum architecture, how policy shapes the architecture and how architecture shapes the experience. I will introduce each speaker and they will present. If there are any quick questions, we can answer those immediately, but there will be a much longer block of time for questions and answers after all four of them have presented. If you have any questions for the panelists, please pop them into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. If you have any comments for the panelists or to share with everyone, you can use the chat feature. I will be popping additional information in the chat box occasionally myself. We will begin with Shoshana Goldberg Miller, who is an Associate Professor in Arts Administration, Education and Policy at The Ohio State University. She examines how cities use arts and culture in planning, fostering livable communities and creating economic development strategies to build their brand, attract residents and tourists and distinguish themselves from other urban centers worldwide. So Shoshana will share her screen and take it away. Thank you so much, Georgia. I'm delighted to be here with my colleagues and with you and really appreciate it. So today I'm going to talk about the Royal Ontario Museum and we're going to really dig into some policy issues with that and, and how the museum was part of a stakeholder partnership to really make a difference in that city. So I'm going to talk about the relationship between cultural policy and the increased presence of arts and culture in economic development in Toronto in the 2000s and specifically what the role of anchor cultural institutions, specifically the Royal Ontario Museum, was in this process. So my work is a case study of Toronto in the 2000s. And as I said, looking at cultural policy and economic development. And my underlying theory in this work is agenda setting. I also look at cultural economics, cultural policy, arts and culture and economic development. And I'm happy to say that the research for this work was funded by a generous grant from the Rockefeller Foundation. So for the methods for this research were 21 semi-structure elite interviews with policymakers, elected officials, artists, developers, arts managers, urban planners, appointed officials and philanthropists and historical and archival research. So I found that Toronto's stakeholders utilized arts and culture and economic development to build the city in that decade. And it was a tool to reimagine the city with these elite stakeholders involved. And I believe that policy frameworks can inform creative placemaking. So let's take a look at Toronto. So Toronto is, um, was a cultural Camelot during that decade. There was the endogenous shock of a late 90s amalgamation of several city areas into the city of Toronto, which created a perfect cultural storm. There was a lot of interest in that city in entering the knowledge economy, a culture friendly mayor and cultural and economic development became one department within the city. And there was a lot of research. Richard Florida was there on cultural economy and creative cities and policy entrepreneurs, including the leadership of the Royal Ontario Museum proposed a billion dollar cultural renaissance, a big build 
And this brought together the provincial, federal, and private sector actors as stakeholders. And so in that decade, Toronto used arts and culture to define the city and created a perfect cultural storm. So you had the embedded cultural municipal staff and a culture friendly mayor. You had a team of cultural nonprofit leaders. Among them were the leaders of the Royal Ontario Museum. You had investment by the government. And of course you had this creative city framework and private sector monies that were brought in. So we can see that Toronto is an example of visible cultural policy. These departments being integrated together, this cultural renaissance to rebuild the major cultural institutions and growth of events, cultural events in the city and participation both by the mayor and by outside funders, including the province, federal government, corporate donors and philanthropists. Now, what was the, the museum's role in this cultural renaissance? The leadership of the Royal Ontario Museum were what we call policy entrepreneurs. And the Michael Lee Chin Crystal, which, which was the uh, addition to the museum, was a defining addition and really rebranded the museum as innovative and, and edgy during this time. It became the ultimate symbol of the big build and became Toronto's visual icon. And I'd like to show a few pictures of this amazing structure, which juts out from a very uh, traditional and uh, quite old building. And it hangs over the street. This is another view. And in the book, it has all the captions, but I want to, to thank the Royal Ontario Museum for these images. And then this shows the way that the museum edition is part of this very old Rococo part of the museum. Uh, this is an inside look at a staircase and one of the galleries and the museum at night. Now you can see that it's, it's quite astounding, this, this architecture there. So the thing about this is it's really part of what I call, what we call, we know as agenda setting theory. And as I mentioned, these policy entrepreneurs sparked this development. And this helps us understand how this open policy window of amalgamation in the city. And really what happened is the problems, politics and policy were joined together. And so we're going to examine that now. So I want to, uh, to go through some of the aspects that arts and culture have in a city and how it impacts economic development. So we know cultural districts, global competition, the role of economic development, these assets that a city may have, and of course the anchor cultural institutions, uh, one of which was the Royal Ontario Museum and these other creative economy entities. And we know that the cultural built environment of which the ROM is an example, is one of the aspects of creative cultural policy as is zoning, our zoning permits, city planning using arts and culture, tax abatements for for-profit entities and tracking and report as policy tools. And then the perception of cultural policy plays a role in this and a municipal cultural strategy included the idea of this big build uh, of course, the data were there to support the fact that the provincial and federal government could, could contribute money to these big bills because it was considered a public good and an economic benefit. And that was part of a cultural plan that Toronto had. Uh, and they reached out to partnership and, and integrate this policy. And of course, there often are financial challenges. Now, who are the stakeholders involved in this kind of a thing? You have, of course, a mayor, city council, the private sector, the cultural community, arts intermediaries, nonprofit organizations, of which the ROM was one, corporate sponsorship, partnerships, and the government agencies. So all of these work together to really make this happen. And that's one, one of the things that's really exciting about a museum making such a difference. <clears throat> Excuse me. So how can we see what arts and culture, uh, you know, the benefit that it gives to a city? Uh, it's part of 
community development. We know that tourism plays a big role, the cultural industries, public art, cultural events, cultural producers, and revitalization. And then of course, we look at what arts and culture mean in the city. And we know that it's economic development, demand, social benefit, diversity, pride of place, education and youth, the quality of life, accessibility and creativity. And these things are really important when we look at some of the interviewees and what they thought the role was of arts and culture in that decade. So I want to just quickly talk a little bit about some of the top things that these, these interviewees had to say. Uh, they thought that economic development and arts and culture being incorporated together made a really big difference in this cultural renaissance and that the iconic architecture of which the Rom edition was a prime example was really a key in fostering this kind of global identity for Toronto over that decade. And these actors in the city really built a collegial atmosphere. They worked together and they wanted to have cultural planning goals and economic development goals together. And uh, as we can see that this revitalized a lot of the building stock and that the funding the, the, the federal government as well as private sector actors were able to, to bring money into this cultural renaissance because there was a case made through the research on this. And so we know that in arts and culture and public good that the idea of diversity was really something that was embedded in Toronto's core identity and is part of the Canadian ethos. So this idea of the museum being uh, an iconic representation of the cultural renaissance and also being a place that really welcomed uh, many diverse attendees and diverse exhibits. And then of course about the stakeholder partnerships that these partnerships were essential to the success of this project. And we know that the mayor was a leader who was very visible on that and the arts community as well as all of the leaders of these anchor cultural institutions were, were very important in making this a success. So let's take a look at some of the things that Toronto did and that other cities can do as far as integrating arts and culture in economic development and in public good. So one of the things that cities need to do is really figure out the ways that arts and culture can support economic development agendas and integrate these findings into a variety of policy interventions and create a buy-in to a creative city plan. So that's one of the things that the leadership of the ROM did is they, they created a plan, they worked together with the city, but then they really fostered a buy-in for that, which really helped raise the awareness of the creative community's economic and social impact and really identified strategies for future growth. Now Toronto produces and still continues to produce many research uh, reports and in analyzing the sector and use these to guide these policy development and you know, using arts and, and culture. So that what they do is we, they really use data. Secondly, they really look at partnerships and that's a very important thing across policy domains and sectors and to for cities to facilitate consultation and open dialogue between the public and the private sector actors. And in this case, the, the public sector actors the, uh, or the nonprofit sector actors, the, the leaders of the anchor institutions, including the ROM, were the ones that really led this out. And a city can be a convener and a locus for this kind of activity and really leverage the private sector support. So the, uh, the, the big build included the ROM Michael Lee Chin Crystal, and that was funded with a huge gift from, from that um, uh, entrepreneur. And that's an example of reaching into the private sector. And also, of course, uh, they had to gain the buy-in from the cultural communities. Now Toronto saw that it was very important to build these kinds of partnerships and the municipal actors led that out, but the non-city actors felt included and they had to build very robust cross-sector and multi-domain ties. 
So the third aspect is really about integrating arts and culture into economic development, but really looking at economic and social goals. So what are the public good benefits of having a, uh, you know, a, a renovated museum, of having a museum leadership that's a part of municipal strategy and planning? And how does that unify aspects and facets of the economic development? Because it really looks at addressing multiple stakeholder goals. It's not just benefiting financially, it's benefiting a city for its pride of place, benefits to future generation, and many of the issues that we address in the cultural policy and cultural economics. We want to build our brand, generate revenue, and enhance public good, and create what I think is an urban cultural policy ecosystem, which really has to do with identity and brand, the public good, the creative economy, the built cultural environment of which the museum was an example, stakeholder partnerships, and economic development all imb imbued with creative citizenship. So in conclusion, I believe that my work and this chapter in this very exciting book really brings a policy perspective to the creative cities conversation. And I use the lens of policy theories and frameworks to look at creative placemaking. And I believe that it's a tool that can really enhance arts and culture and economic development in cities and regions worldwide. So thank you so much. And that's me. Thanks, Shoshana. Of course, you're very welcome. Um, just, I don't see any quick questions coming through. So we're just going to move along and save all of our big questions for at the end. So next, um, Matt Patter we have Matt Patterson. Um, he is an assistant professor in sociology at the University of Calgary. His research concerns the role of culture and the cultural industries in urban life and, and has appeared in journals such as Urban Studies, City and Community, Poetics and Qualitative Sociology. Um, you can read more about him in the link that I just shared and take it away. Thank you. Uh, so everyone's going to learn a lot about the Royal Ontario Museum <laughs> because I'm going to talk about it uh, as well. Uh, my uh, chapter is called Building Citizens by Building Museums. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, there's two premises at the beginning of my chapter. The first is that museums are institutions that function in part to articulate and promote certain notions of civic identity. And so this is a, a core idea within museum studies. Uh, and the second premise comes from the sociology of architecture, which is that buildings aren't passive containers for social institutions. They actually influence how institutions function. And so when you put those two premises together that come from separate literatures, you arrive at the question that's at the center of my chapter, which is how does museum architecture reflect and promote certain notions of civic identity? I, and uh, you know, as I mentioned, I use uh, two museums actually in Toronto in the chapter to explore this question, the Art Gallery of Ontario, which you see on the left, and the Royal Ontario uh, Museum. Uh, and in the interest of time, I'm just going to focus on the Royal Ontario Museum in this presentation. Uh, so I, I'm just going to call it the ROM uh, for short. It's a natural and cultural history museum. It's uh, just over 100 years old. And what's really useful for my purposes is that it has um, expanded con constantly over its 100 year history, uh, really in, in the form of uh, five distinct wings that were built at different times that allow us to kind of see how it has developed differently within different political climates. So just to begin, I wanna just uh, take you on a, a whirlwind tour through the architectural history of this building. Uh, the, the original building is this uh, Romanesque rectangle you see here built on the University of Toronto campus uh, in the 1930s as part of a, a make work project in the Great Depression. They expanded it into this H-shaped uh, building still using a Beaux-Arts style architecture, although this was this wing was Gothic and, and uh, Byzantine ornamentation. Uh, in the late 60s, at the height of the space race, they built a planetarium, uh, you know, the modernist building you see here in the early 80s. Uh, 
they added two uh, brutalist uh, wings that kind of filled in the empty spaces in the H to the north and the south. And then finally, as now you are familiar with, uh, in 2007, they, they demolished the northern wing the, uh, that they had built in the early 80s and built this crystalline building designed by Daniel Liebskin. So how do we make sense of this architectural change over time? Well, for that, I turn to a sociologist named Thomas Guerin, who wrote this essay, What Buildings Do. And his main thesis in the, in the essay was that buildings support institutions by stabilizing social life. So if we define institutions as basically reproduced social practices that occur over space and time, you know, buildings help reproduce social action. They kind of force us to do the same thing over and over and over again, but they do so imperfectly. And what does he mean by that? Well, um, he, he has these three analytic moments that are at his, the core of his analysis of, of buildings. The first is in the design and development of a building. And when you design a building, uh, you design it based on someone's vision of the world, someone's view of how the institution should function. So some people's understandings get encoded into the physical form of the building and other people don't, right? So it includes certain social influences and excludes others in the final form of the building. Now, once the building exists, it becomes what Yuren calls a black box, uh, which means it, it steers and it influences social action in ways that are unrecognizable often to the actors themselves. So if you have a museum and there's a room full of expensive uh, secret stuff that you don't want the general public to, to see. One thing you can do is put a security guard in front of it telling people to stop. Uh, but then, you know, the public is aware that they are being controlled, right? Uh, but the other thing you can do is just build a wall in front of that uh, room. And then you've accomplished the same thing, but people don't actually realize they're being controlled, right? So, so buildings do this. They direct us in certain paths. They separate people and things from each other all without uh, us realizing what's happening. And then finally, uh, readaptation that actors creatively reinterpret and reconfigure buildings in ways that were never intended by their original designers. That's where the imperfectly comes in. We do have agency in, in trying to shape buildings even after they've been built. Um, so if you take that analysis and apply it to my original question about civic identity and public life, uh, I arrive at a, a diagram that looks like this, which is that in any, in any given uh, political epoch, there's going to be these, this dominant political logic, this, you know, dominant ideas about who we are as a society, you know, who is a citizen, what does it mean to be a citizen, what is the role of government in public life, what is the role of museums in, in public life. And so those dominant ideas are going to influence the design and development of, of a museum. And, you know, over time, political logics evolve. We go from one epoch to, to another. Uh, but the, the museum, once built, will be influencing the way a society understands itself. Nonetheless, um, uh, evolution occurs. And uh, at some point, people will look at the museum and think it, it needs to be brought up into the the present, so it needs to be adapted and redeveloped. And when that happens, any kind of attempt to redevelop the, the museum occurs in, uh, in dialogue, in interaction with the building as it already exists. So that's why I have a line going from building A to building B. You have to work with what you have, um, even if you end up just demolishing the entire thing and, and rebuilding from scratch. So in the chapter, I divide Canadian history into these three epochs. Um, I won't go into them in, in detail. Uh, the imperial period from the founding of Canada to the end of the Second World War. You know, elites in public li in public life in Canada really uh, held strong to the British Empire. They really wanted um, Canadians to think of themselves as British subjects. Um, there's all kinds of racist uh, reasons behind this, um, but anyway. Uh, the chapter goes into that in a little more detail. Uh, in the post-war era, Canada really breaks with the British Empire. It charts out this post-British uh, identity for Canada, like new flag, new national anthem. It liberalizes uh, immigration uh, laws so that the population as a whole becomes a lot more 
diverse racially and, and ethnically. And, and so there's a, an official policy of multiculturalism gets adopted. And, and this is also the period where you have the rise of the welfare state and uh, relevant to, to my story is that there's lots of, of investment in cultural and educational institutions as part of this nation building uh, initiative. And finally, by the, the late 80s, we get into the new neoliberal period, you know, across the world, but also in, in Canada, where there's a lot of cutbacks to the welfare state, a lot of retreating of government from certain areas, including culture and education, uh, less of an emphasis on building up a certain idea of Canadian identity. Uh, instead, there's more emphasis on, you know, cosmopolitanism, globalization, and, and more of a role for the market and capitalism in public life, and the rise of this thing called the consumer citizen. We think of people not only as citizens, but also as consumers. Uh, so in addition to thinking about these three epochs, uh, in analyzing how the ROM uh, shifted over time through these, these three eras, uh, I was influenced by Stuart Brand's book, uh, How Buildings Learn. I have to thank Georgia for uh, suggesting I read this book. Uh, Brand argues that architecture can be thought of as, as being made up of different layers that are that change and adapt at different rates. So that some are more stable and others are more plastic. So I applied that idea to the ROM and came up with different elements of museum architecture that I think change at different rates. So location, external interface, aesthetic surface, and internal layout, I will, um, I'll uh, explain them in a little bit more detail. But here that I've kind of arranged them from most external to most internal and most stable to most plastic. Uh, and so my, my methodology for this chapter was basically to look at the ROM and also the, the Art Gallery of Ontario at each of these, during each of these periods to see how the different elements have changed. And so uh, for the remainder of the time I have, uh, and please Georgia, just like, let me know when I've run out of time because I forgot to set my stopwatch, but uh, I'm just gonna take you through a tour of the, the different elements, starting with location. So, um, you know, locations of museums are very important because once you build a museum, it becomes a, a political center of gravity that draws in resources and people and, and buzz or status. So, you know, where museums are located typically uh, reflects the political and economic dynamics of the time when they were founded, right? So uh, Toronto being a major commercial center in Canada and the capital city of the province of Ontario, it kind of explains why some of the biggest museums in Canada are located there. But once a museum is built, it changes the political and public character of, of the place. And uh, the Guggenheim Bilbao is an excellent example of that. The Bilbao effect is, you know, you build a museum and then this waterfront completely changes because of the museum. So just briefly, uh, you know, getting back to the, the ROM, it was built in what was at the time this leafy, sleepy residential, very wealthy residential enclave uh, on the outskirts of the city. And you can see the, the, the men who founded it, uh, many of them residents of that area, the, the mansion that occupied the land before the museum was built. But, you know, once you build this museum, it's, it influences how that neighborhood's going to develop. And today, um, that area is a major tourist and commercial destination within the city. Uh, next, the external interface, which refers to the way in which a museum relates to its immediate surroundings and suggests its intended users and shapes how they interact with and access the museum. So the, the ROM was lucky enough to be built in a, in a time before cars were widely used, right? So it's actually very accessible um, to pedestrians on the streets, but of course we know museums built in the post-war era were often built as fortresses, right? Because they were not meant for the pedestrians walking on the street. In fact, they're often built in these areas that were considered dangerous, you know, in the inner city. Uh, so they're built as fortresses, but they are convenient for people driving in off the expressway, right? Coming into the parking garage and leaving there. Uh, and one thing that's really noticeable in neoliberalism, in, a, in a, like a period of neoliberalism, is that the commercial aspects of museums have often been moved right to the front, 
So in the external interface of museums, where the museum as an institution meets the public life on the streets, uh, this is where it, this area is increasingly taken up by, you know, gift shops, um, uh, restaurants, cafes, uh, things like that. And that's true of the ROM's latest edition as, as well. So it, it's changing the relationship between the museum and the public and changing the way that we think of the public, not as, not as citizens who have access to these, you know, um, these uh, artifacts and, and art and culture, but as consumers who are gonna spend money at the museum. Uh, aesthetic surface, so uh, how the building looks aesthetically on the inside and the outside. Uh, museums are icons, and uh, what that means is they have these distinct aesthetic surfaces that evoke powerful social meanings. The, the, the aesthetic decisions we make in designing them are meant to evoke certain meanings. Uh, and so we can apply that analysis to the external surface of museums. Uh, one decision that often gets made is, do you want the museum to fit in with the neighborhood or do you want it to stand out? Uh, but I wanna just focus on the internal surfaces uh, which communicate the ideal users for the museum. And, and what I mean by that, uh, we can see by looking at these same prehistoric, prehistoric mammal skeletons in the three eras, uh, in the first image there from the imperial era, I mean, surrounded by display cases. I mean, the, the ideal patron or the ideal visitor here was a student, you know, who's going to study this, these artifacts academically. In the post-war era, that's where you get the, the dioramas and the special effects and, and all the what we call it, um, edutainment, right? And this is a, kind of a theme park in a museum because it's, it's, you know, this is uh, families coming in from the, the suburbs, you know, with their kids to, to be entertained. And in the most recent expansion of the ROM, it, we actually go back in time in the plain, you know, minimalism. Uh, but here the emphasis is really on uh, young professionals, the so-called creative class. I mean, the museum as an art gallery, not so much for students, but people who want to appreciate the fossils as, as art, basically. And then finally, the last thing I'll, I'll say, and then I'll, I'll finish off, is, is the internal layout. So uh, I make the case in the, in the chapter that architecture creates affordances for curators. It basically, it doesn't determine how curators are going to represent things, but it, it does uh, encourage certain arrangements of artifacts over others. So with long halls, which you get in, these, uh, in the Beaux-Arts imperial period, you know, they lend themselves to this historical or pro, uh, narrative of progress, you know, moving from the dark ages to the enlightenment, you know, which was big in, in, in the imperial period. Uh, open areas encourage nonlinear narratives. Uh, uh, separate wings encourage equivalence, you know, the wing of American art versus the wing of European art. And floors uh, contain implicit value judgments, you know, high status works on the main floor, lower status works in the basement. I mean, how many museums have you visited where the anthropological collection or the so-called ethnic art is in the basement, right? Um, so that's, uh, and I won't go into the internal layout, but uh, just to conclude, I'll just say that museums in place and they displace otherwise abstract notions of, of civic identity. That means they, they solidify certain notions, but they're also these, um, these spaces where we can go to challenge uh, existing uh, notions of, of citizenship. Uh, and so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks so much, Matt. That's great. Um, next up, well, before I introduce the next speaker, I just want to say that one of the things that I was hoping to do in this book um, was bring together people, scholars who had very different perspectives on museum architecture and design and sort of have their work be in conversation. So. So far, we've heard from sort of policy and sociology, and then the next two speakers today are really much um, more focused on the experience of architecture and how these sort of um, policy and sociology ideas then just get, get played out in terms of how people, um, visitors interpret and experience the museums. And so um, I'm excited to have that sort of um, collection that, clashing of different disciplinary ideas in the book and also in today's panel. So next we have 
Jade. And Jade Polizzi is a licensed architect and a senior instructor at the University of Colorado's program in environmental design. Her primary research focus is in design build and service learning with a much more re recent focus on public structures and exhibit design. She also teaches, she has extensive teaching experience and teaches studio classes, history and construction methods. And you can read more about Jade here. Great, thank you, Georgia. So. Um, as Georgia and, and this, these were both really interesting, uh, listening to Shoshani and, and Matt talk about their work. Um, when, when, so Georgia and I have known each other for a number of years. And um, in 2017, I, I'm, I'm an architect and my husband's an architect and we have two young daughters. Uh, at the time, they were eight and 11. And Around that time, we decided that we really wanted to spend a year and explore the world. And so we took our, our two children out of school and uh, we spent a, a year traveling, um, primarily in Europe, but we also spent some time in Asia and New Zealand. Um, and, and so I was also homeschooling them and I was a little bit worried that um, homeschooling my children, I, I was gonna bring them back to the States and really be kind of evaluated in what I was teaching them. And so I decided what we were going to do is visit as many um, museums and, and architectural sites as we possibly could. And I don't have the exact number handy, but I think it's somewhere um, close to 200. I did, I actually made a list at one point. Um, so I came back from my trip and Georgia and I were talking at school and she said, I'm editing this book on museum design. And you have visited so many museums and um, would you be interested in contributing a chapter? And so I was flattered to be asked to do something like that. And, and so I said, sure. And, and which museum should I actually talk about? So um, I, I kind of thought back and I said, which one perhaps made the biggest impact on me? And I have to say it was, it was a trip to a museum that I didn't know anything about prior to visiting, but um, I was in the, the fairly small town of Aarhus, Denmark, and visited the Mosgard Museum uh, one, one afternoon. And, um, and so the, the Mosgard Museum, to, to kind of speak to what Matt was discussing, um, it's an archaeological museum and um, an ethnographic museum. And so all of their exhibits, for the most part, are in the basement. So, but, but that was done on purpose here. Um, so the building is, is really kind of interesting architecturally. It was designed by Henning Larson and it was constructed in 2014. Um, and, and you approach it by um, traveling through this, this park. So it's kind of in the outskirts of Arhas. And, um, and, you, and this is the view that you get when you're looking towards the museum. And so it's made of concrete, um, of stone, glass, and then probably the most noticeable feature is, is sod, the, the sod roof that it has. Um, it's not particularly large compared to a number of other museums of, of its caliber. Um, and but what I really liked about it is just the way that the, the exhibits will really draw you in and create this, um, this real connection to um, archeology span and, and uh, prehistoric artifacts. So, um, so as you see, you're kind of looking at it, you can, you can experience the building thoroughly, not just inside of it, but also on the roof. And I have another picture of the, some more pictures of the roof later on. Um, but, but it's really integrating into the environment. So if you think about it as an architectural piece, it's, it's really not speaking to um, modernism or contemporary design or even um, sort of historical connotations, but it's really trying to be one with the earth. So really kind of something that might have be um, erupting out of the earth that had been buried long ago, or maybe something that was left on, you know, on the land and is slowly kind of sinking back into the earth. So, um, so really kind of beautiful in, in its form. Um, the, the plan, so you actually enter in this plan zero one where there's a, a foyer and a cafe um, and, and some special um, exhibitions. And, and most of the time you actually will go downstairs into the, the um, 
ethnographic and um, antiquity uh, realm, which is sort of over here on, on the screen. Um, you can also go upstairs to, um, to some of the other, the, the temporary exhibitions. Um, and, and then this is where they also have conferences and, and guest residences. But sort of entering into the museum, here's, here's some images of, of what you experience. And, um, and you know, this kind of grand, um, grand uh, entryway, uh, again, it's, it's kind of austere. It's, it's a fairly neutral palette, um, but just thinking about the materials they're using, it's um, stone, concrete, wood, um, but there's definitely a human touch uh, and this kind of human scale to, to the space. Um, and and the, the whole museum is sort of around this, this large staircase. It's where all of the exhibits actually begin. So, um, so the, as I said, the, the lower levels, um, they're the more permanent exhibitions. Um, that includes uh, the Danish, Scandinavian, European history and culture. Um, and what I love, so, so in this, this staircase, it kind of becomes an exhibit and the, the way that they communicate um, to, to the viewer. Um, so I, I think I was telling Georgia, um, this image on the right is, is a picture of my daughter who was 12 years old at the time. And, and you know, she, they can actually interact with these uh, full size people from prehistoric times. And so she was kind of impressed that she was the, you know, the full height of this, um, this ancient man from, from that time. And so you have these kind of figures that are located on the stairs that you can come right up to and examine and explore. Um, further up on the staircase, there is um, some of today's contemporary philosophers, and this is called the, the origin stairs, where there's, there's this conversation that's being played out in a, an audio recording um, of Stephen Hawking. Um, and and they're, they're discussing sort of how we came to, to be. So there are different, um, different diverse viewpoints. And, and so the visitors can kind of watch and experience it. And, and then they have this, this sort of waterfall that's flowing down the staircase this, that almost appears to, to be this creek. And it's just an example of how the, the designers of the exhibits and the galleries were really trying to engage um, multiple senses. So we have this acoustic experience, this visual experience, um, and, then, and then even this almost physical, right? Where you can imagine the, the water kind of flowing down this staircase. Um, and then, and then I think the the way what what really um, appealed to me was the way that all of the different elements were displayed. So I, I visited so many museums where you would have one object that's placed on a pedestal, and there'd be this kind of small description about it, and and you read the the description, you go to the next object. Um, but these the the um, the objects were, were almost piled together. Um, this, this set of combs that, and you can see, you know, some of them, the bristles are broken. They're, they're a slightly different material, but just this idea that this comb was made um, hundreds and thousands of times, you know, repeatedly. And, um, but, it, but it had the same technique. So it really kind of um, makes our present day connection. I mean, we're still producing hundreds and thousands of combs and it hasn't really changed that much over time. So um, you're walking through this exhibit and, and the walls are pierced with arrows um, with this idea that perhaps there was a battle that happened just moments before you, you actually got to the space or, um, or this one display that, that looks at the soldiers' um, tools and, and armor that they would use. And, and it almost becomes this kind of mock army. So it's not that each element is kind of um, sacred, sort of preserved in this sacred way, but, but that all of them sort of together start to create this experience of us being part of humanity and this kind of um, this, this lineage that we're carrying out. So um, some of the other ones, I, these stories actually start to kind of, they give light to, to the artifacts. So um, I, I love viewing museums from this kind of storytelling tradition. And, and so what it really starts to do is kind of connect you to, to the past. Um, I remember there was a story and I, I don't have a picture of this, but there was a number of different razors and they talk about 
um, how this boy would, you know, a, a boy would get a razor as a gift um, as he made that transition into adulthood and something that we could actually imagine doing today, right? It's the, the our lives maybe haven't changed all that much, even though we have computers and we have cars that we're still kind of living that same experience. Um, and, and then really this, this sensorial um, element that, that we see in, in the design. So um, the, the Most Guard Museum, it actually has this in-house design studio that um, is composed of um, set designers, user experience designers, archeologists, photographers, and game designers. And so they're all working together to try to find the best way to tell these stories and display these artifacts um, to sort of increase the, and, and to make the best experience for the users. So, um, so this definitely multi, multimedia. Um, sometimes you, you're talking to a screen, you know, you're, you're reading questions, um, you, you can choose your language, right? Which, which is great. Um, but, you know, pressing buttons and having your questions answered by um, professionals. And it almost feels as, it's a, as if it's a, a real-time experience. You know, today's current questions um, are being answered. Um, there's, they're also looking at other sensory experiences. So, you know, here um, we have the, the Stone Age exhibit, but it's being illuminated by the cosmos, the planets and the stars and, you know, and, and even sort of the, the atmosphere. Um, and, and so this idea that we're sort of all still part of, of this world. So here's, here's another one. Um, and, and, and these people are, you're literally walking through this battle screen. So you have these, these giant TVs um, and you're, you're kind of going through this hallway where um, these, these screens, we have the, the people in the blue and the people in the red, and it, it's kind of this stylized um, sort of watercolor experience, um, but the sound of the battle is being sort of played out over you, and, and you can watch someone on, on horseback just sort of running towards you, um, running, you know, they, they sort of go right past, and then you can see them receding into, um, you know, into the, towards the other uh, troop, so. Um, really kind of puts you in the center. Um, and, and so again, they're, they're blending these sounds, this, um, the, the visual technology um, and, and sort of creating this incredible experience. When you go into the, the Day of the Dead exhibit, they, they scan your body and, and then um, your physical form is projected onto a wall um, as a skeleton in part of a mariachi band. So, you know, really trying to um, engage, engage the public and, you know, which makes you, it sort of puts you in the center of the exhibit. Um, and then, and then the, probably the, the um, crowning jewels of, of this museum is, um, is some of these, uh, these remains, these human remains. And, and so, um, there's, there's one, the, if, if I knew I was going to have to pronounce these, these uh, Danish words, I might not have actually written a paper. I would, I would have chosen a, a project a little bit closer to home. Um, but, but the Borum, the Borum Eshi bodies, and these are three bodies that actually date back to over 3,000 years ago. And, and they're in their um, hollowed out logs that were coffins. Um, they're actually sort of placed inside of this full-size barrel that's, um, you know, that's, that's, so you're sort of inside of this burial chamber. Um, and then, and then this last one, um, the, the best preserved bog body, the, the Graubau man. And, and so the way they, they, the, there's a soundtrack as you're moving through this museum on um, this kind of avant-garde um, sort of electronic undersong and and sometimes it's creating this sort of glittering and um, an animated experience and and other times the music starts to actually create a more somber mode so um, so as you're entering into the um, this chamber where the the um, Grobel man is is sort of laid down um, the ground actually changes the the um, air condition is a little bit higher to actually make the the viewer feel just a little bit chilly um, as if you know this person 
um, whose body he was a he was a um, apparently uh, we believe a, a sacrifice that was thrown into this bog and the way that his body was preserved um, you can even see the slit that was in his throat um, so so really thinking about how do we change the environment to bring the users into this space and make them feel as if they're walking into the marsh that they're actually discovering these objects as if they were sort of their they were archaeologists themselves so you know the museum is really becomes this kind of vehicle for for telling stories by heightening our senses um, and creating this uh, this emotional experience rather than just this um, sort of fact telling experience that we see with a number of other other museums and then lastly, to kind of bring you outside again. So, you know, some of these exhibits can be very intense. They can be um, pretty strong. And so you can step out into this grass roof um, where you can get views of the surrounding landscape. Um, you can picnic, uh, roll down the grass. And, and apparently the uh, museum is actually open in the winter for, for sledding. So um, the museum, again, kind of being this, this relic um, that, that made is sort of discovered by, by the visitor. All right, thank you. Great, thanks so much, Jade. Um, and last, we have, but certainly not least, we have Helen Nori, who is a senior lecturer in architecture and design here at the University of Tasmania, along with me, and the founder of the, among other things, the founder of the Regional Urban Studies Laboratory, shortened Russell, which is a collaborative urban design research project that engages directly with local councils and communities to examine urban spatial, temporal, and social issues in small towns and cities. Thanks, Georgia. Um, a, there's some really great links between everyone, which has been um, really fantastic. Um, I'm going to talk about some work, which is it basically comes out of my PhD, which is called Urban Narratives, Museums in the City. And I'm particularly interested in how individual buildings can set up um, broader or engage with the broader story of the place in which they're located. Um, so I've got a, a whole bunch of different examples that I'm going to fly you through from all around the world. But um, it's really interesting, I think, how the um, definition of a museum or the role of it has really oscillated from being a storehouse to a site of display and a place of research. Um, and it, that it's variously promoted agendas of entertainment and education, and it kind of goes backwards and forwards between those agendas at different points in time. Um, the um, Pierre Elbich talks about the fact that he thinks that there's three phases of museums, that it starts as a storehouse and a place for safe keep, safekeeping and display. And often there was a lot of status attached to the things that were being displayed. And then the second phase started to um, be influenced by the development of scientific principles. And there was a shift from uh, to the whole idea of the observable um, aspects of objects that became really important. And around this time, these sorts of spaces started to be developed with studiolos where people were keeping things, but also scientists were being able to come in and view these connections and to use them as part of um, scientific exploration. And then Albert suggests that the third phase is when we start to see more of a, a concern for concepts that start taking precedence over an interest in objects in themselves. And generally, I think that uh, there's a lot being talked about, about also the shift from the idea of the museum as a temple um, to that as a forum, and there's a big flip in that. Um, museums as an architectural topology um, really started to kick off. The, the term museum dates back from the 1500s. Um, there's loads of different definitions of um, the word at different points in time. But really, um, it's understood that our museum comes from the um, Grand Duke of Tuscany in 1584, setting up a, um, some spaces that actually started to, where the term museum or museum started to be used. And then the Museum Tradescum um, was actually developed in um, 1634 in um, in England. And then the, some of these are examples of the kinds of architecture that started in the early days. And very key to this is the images in the middle of um, Jean-Nicolas Claude Durand, who de developed the Paradigmatic Design Museum. And one of the things that was really um, interesting as um, 
around this era is that a lot of the um, palaces and castles were also used to collect art. And there's this really lovely idea of the fact that there's, um, that people would take a tour through these palaces and art like they were going for exercise. And that was, that things became um, preoccupied with this notion of an attractive presentation, but also going through a walk, a walk through things. At this time, two gardens uh, were often setting for arts and art, and so the larger context of the museum actually was really important, and I find that quite interesting in relation to a lot of the museums now. Um, but basically, um, through the second half of the 18th century, private collections across Europe were progressively open to the public, and the Palais Lux Luxembourg in Paris um, opened, and the Royal Collection of the Louvre became the, the Musée Louvre in 1793, and the British Museum um, formed following public lobbying and the, the bequest of private collections in 1759. And around this time, um, Durand is actually starting to develop these kind of rules and systems for certain types of um, formal architecture. And so the, this, um, the rules that he set up was really this idea of a museum that had a central rotunda that provided a grand orienting space and a series of long interconnected vaulted corridors that you moved on filade, which meant that you move from one space to the next and effectively it was a linear progression. And um, there's been a lot of talk about the fact that these, that um, at the museums that then started to be developed from here, um, like these sets of museums, that they're really seen as a tool of sort of Victorian pedagogy and this notion of learning. So it's at a time too that when there was very much a linear understanding of the fact that history was a progression towards things that were better. And the idea that the, um, the, the path was a sequence that you had to go through to learn things. I'm really interested then in some of the work that Sophia Sara has been doing about museum experience and connecting to space syntax things and analyzing the physical structure of museum in terms of the degree of um, how fixed the roots are, how flexible they are, either through branches that you can take turns off and come back and see things or things that are described as ringy where there's lots of different paths and you can wander around and come backwards and forwards and the museum itself becomes quite a labyrinth. And often in those museums, the central orienting space is the key thing that gives you a sense of where you are. But it's interesting because I think that there's um, a big shift uh, in the difference between you must see the museum in this way to you can take a, um, a tour in any other way. And there's some really interesting terms of um, these early museums where they were described as cultural conveyor belts, the whole idea that you got on the conveyor belt and you went through. So some really beautiful uh, terms related to all of that. Um, but what I'm particularly interested in is this idea of museum staging experience so that they're not um, just about um, this didactic learning, but they're also about experience in some way. And in architecture, uh, Le Corbusier is really well known for developing the idea of the promenade architecturale, which is that the buildings are um, designed in relation to the movement of people. And this is very much an idea that was very um, popular and came out of the picturesque landscape. Um, one of the really interesting buildings that Le Corbusier was actually influenced by was uh, quite interestingly this, um, the Outlook Tower by Patrick Geddes in Edinburgh. And it was a very interesting idea um, for a museum where it was sort of the, uh, the this idea that the um, it was really aimed to resituate the individual in the world and transform the entire city into the museum into a museum in itself. So what you did is that you worked your way up through the museum. You went up to the top and it had a camera obscura that let you see the city in its context, which is quite incredible at that time. And then you came down to the next floor and you understood Edinburgh. And then the, the floor below was Scotland. The, the floor below that was actually the English speaking countries down to Europe and down to the world. So there was something about the path that you took through the museum that was also related to um, these broader conceptual ideas. So there's this, this has been described um, by Volker Velter as um, this idea of the exhibition presenting an ever widening geographical and cultural zones. Um, so this relationship between the museum and context, I find really particularly interesting in Belter um, describes this museum as a, a kind of an open air museum in a way and the city of the future rooted in the past. So um, some of the other buildings that I find really interesting in relation to this are um, places like the Castel Vecchio by Carlo Scarpa. Now, interestingly, this building looks like 
from a you know an untrained eye to a very careful um, adaptive reuse but it's actually a lot of um, pretty whole scale demolition that was involved in this building and a really strong rewriting of a narrative and um, it's all centered around this little statue up here on the left um, the Can Grande, and that's actually a statue to very significant people in the town. And the whole thing is set up so that as you walk through the threshold of the, the gate, that the wall that bounds the museum, you see the Can Grande in the distance, and then you walk towards the door. And as you walk through the building, you're constantly getting views out across the river and you keep revisiting the Can Grande. And this is very, very similar to landscape principles of the picturesque, where the idea that you see something and you lose it and you see it again, gives you a sense of narrative of things being connected to each other. Um, so uh, there's, it's been suggested that this provokes a profound reflection on the relationship between the ancient and the modern, and that the architect's museological work um, is inseparable from um, the, the staging becomes part of the, the museological experience. Um, the other person that's really interesting, we've got a bit of a Scandinavian thing going on here is Fefen, and he's done, a, did 50, about 50 different museum designs in his life, and I think about five of them were built because there's an amazing competition policy in Scandinavia, which, which meant that um, he was really able to um, develop a whole lot of ideas, and he has this beautiful notion that a museum is a dance around dead things, um, and that the museum, that, that the relationship between the artifact and the human movement is what's really important. And so he conceptualized this museum, which is actually five centuries of um, different settlements uh, as a kind of theater where the movement is in specific routes around smaller objects, around bigger objects, and then the whole space itself. And Christian Norberg Schultz describes this as a journey through time and space, which I think is um, really beautiful. So there's, it's not really necessarily explicitly didactic, but it's incredibly um, uh, visceral in the way that you experience these things. And things like in the bottom right, uh, what you can't, you can't see the glass objects on the shelf, but you can see the shadow of them being reflected on the, the floor. So there's constant moves where the, the architecture really emphasizes the objectness of the object. And I think some curators to see this negatively in that they see it as quite fetishizing the object as opposed to engaging with the concepts. Fenn's um, Glacier Museum in Fairland is interesting because it's a museum to an object that you can't fit in the museum. It's actually the glacier itself. So what the museum does is it actually is just a, a kind of a ramp um, to which you come and you view the glacier and then you wander around into the inside out of the weather and you can find out a whole lot about the technical details. So you sort of come towards the building and into this fissure like a crater in the mountain um, and you can be in that warm interior or you go up onto the roof and you're part of the broader landscape. Um, in, in Finland, um, Johanni Palasma, who famously wrote a beautiful book called Eyes of the Skin, Architecture of the Senses, um, is also interested in um, the way that the, an instructive narrative can influence a visitor's experience and understanding of the physical and cultural context. So this is actually an open air museum that had been open for many years. And what this is, is really just the gatehouse. And it's for the Sami people of Lapland. And the Sami people actually go across five continents and they're nomadic. And this is the building that actually has their parliament in it. And it's really um, a community center for a lot of nations, um, Nordic, um, native nations. So the thing that's really interesting is that um, this is the view, that's the building in the background and the sequence towards the building, when you come in, you immediately go and come see this view and you go out this very large ramp where you then are immediately um, connected to the landscape and you turn around and come back in to this main gallery where the walls are broken up into 12 pieces and each represents the season the, uh, with an image of the place and then also um, a whole lot of information about what's going on culturally. And then you go back out through the back door into the landscape and you go and see this living museum that has large scale prototypes. Um, but to finish up, the one of the key case studies I looked in my, my thesis I was interested in 19th century museums that had had extensions in the late 20th, early 21st century. And the Museum of Scotland was really interesting. And I'd lived in Edinburgh 
Um, and I, I find that Edinburgh is an amazing city because it's really built around these three hills, which is um, the Edinburgh Castle that's actually not a, it's not a palace, it's a fortification to protect the city. So as a point of outlook, it was really important. The Salisbury Craig is actually where a lot of the observations of the person who was the founder of modern geology made based on the observations of the formation of that rock. And then interestingly, Carlton Hill, which is really a funny little picturesque dream that's part of the new town. And it's all part of after the, um, the parliament moved to England and Scotland um, decided to establish itself as the Athens of the North. So this is a marker of the kind of cultural um, strength of Scotland. But interestingly, people go to the top of these all the time. Like it's a regular thing, weekly thing to walk up to Salisbury Craigs and to go to these places. But when you're on top of any one of them, you can only see two of them. So interestingly, the new museum um, provided a platform in which you could see the city in totality by actually replicating the way the Outlook Tower of Gettys works and making a panopticon from the roof of the museum. So it also transferred, it was a, really an extension to um, a Victorian museum that had a very like steps up to the front of it, very frontal, and it had a big void through the middle. So it replicated the idea of the central void but it actually completely changed um, the, the type of architecture that was being made. There's a, um, as well as the physical routes through the building, there's a lot of associative con connotations and there's very, um, Benson Forsyth are great um, uh, postmodernist architects and they really believe that architecture should have meaning and there's all these very deliberate references between the entry that represents a castle keep um, and asymmetrical composition of the um, Charles Rennie Mackintosh buildings, the um, very simple harling that um, fits on the the uh, very ordinary vernacular buildings around the back, references to Pictish brocks, and then also references to Le Corbusier. Um, so all of these things, it gives, the building gives perspectives on the city, but it also um, deliberately draws on a lineage, a very broad lineage of, um, of architecture. Within the museum itself, the whole um, building is actually orchestrated as this procession as you walk through. And there's these beautiful relationships like you slide into the museum and you look out the window and immediately across the road is this little Scotty dog. And it's apparently a statue of a little dog who was very loyal to its owner. When the owner died, it just sat next to his um, grave in the graveyard across the road. And this is sort of emblematic of, I think in a way the Scots see themselves in terms of loyalty. So so there's some amazing little, um, little moves there, but then there's also some grander moves as you keep moving through the building, there's um, links between the covenant, which was the arrangement between the English and the Scots. And when you turn your head, you look out to the church in which that was actually signed. So there's a constant relationship between the, the vistas that you see out of the building and the content of the story. And then when you get up onto the roof of the building, you then arrive in this incredible landscape in which the foreground is cut out and the castle is brought very close to you. So suddenly you become up at the height of these other um, pieces and then the visual narrative of the city becomes really strong in the end. So really these are just a series of um, broad examples that I think demonstrate the way that museum buildings orchestrate movement and stage experience in a manner that supports the museological agenda. Um, constructing relationships to the context in physical, visual and conceptual ways that really underpin um, narratives of experience and meaning. Thanks. Thanks, Helen. So um, we have a few minutes and I'd like to open it up for questions um, from the uh, from attendees from the audience. So there's a Q&A feature down at the bottom or you can put it in the chat box. Um, and while the um, while everyone is thinking of any questions, I wonder if we could start off with having, with just, um, I am would just like to hear from the panelists. These chapters were written before COVID and we all know that everything is different now spatially. And so I wonder if any of you have any thoughts about how, you know, your conclusions, the ideas you presented in your chapters, how they might be updated in this post-COVID climate? Well, I guess I'll go first. Uh, I would say that, you know, this is, it's an interesting question because I teach here at The Ohio State University arts management and 
cultural policy and many of the students are really interested in museum work and working with arts organizations. And so we're really looking at how, you know, smart practices about management of some of these arts and cultural organizations and also, you know, some of the issues that have to do with technology and the idea that technology is being adapted now for the live arts and, you know, some museums are having virtual tours. So I think that it's really something that, you know, we're looking at what will happen afterwards and also the ways that uh, the creative sector is adapting now to, uh, you know, to, to this issue. I'll jump in next. I think that it's a really super tricky thing. I think that one of the big things that we haven't really got our head around is, I mean, people keep talking about the new COVID normal. And I know for the university's point of view, they've basically said recently that there's only eight buildings that can fit more than 30 people in. And I, it does really, I think that if some of these things about physical distancing, which in Australia are being taken super seriously at the moment, um, and room capacities, if they are going to continue, it, it fundamentally shifts everything about any kind of built infrastructure. And I think it requires a complete reconceptualizing of why people come together and what they do do. I think that one of the things that's interesting about museums in this shift from temple to forum, I do wonder whether a lot of people go to museums as much for all of the interactive stuff than the non-interactive stuff. And whether it does um, ask us to think differently about, um, apparently there's been a huge rise in people watching documentaries on Netflix during COVID. And so whether um, the cultural production it, uh, goes in different ways and it's much more about interaction and through the packaging of things through where narratives and stories are told in complex and more pluralistic ways I'm not sure um, yeah I, I, I'll take a stab at yeah. it I mean like one thing that just came to mind uh, you know I had mentioned the, the kind of increasing prominence of like commercial activity and museums and that their interface to the um, to the public. I mean, the, just this is an issue much more broadly, but like we're seeing the effect of like a local government and uh, local institutions, public institutions that are so dependent on uh, basically like uh, consumer activity, like whether it's like local governments being like dependent on bars and, and restaurants mm -hmm. for their income. Uh, so like, you know, there's just, this is, um, museums didn't have to, used to have to fund themselves through people going to their restaurants uh, or their cafes. Uh, but, you know, over the years, we have uh, forced museums to rely more and more on, on that and event space and, and things like that. So, you know, I haven't been studying museums uh, in the midst of COVID, but I would guess that, you know, that's a huge, huge problem for them is the revenue loss for for their restaurants and for their event spaces. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from the, the audience. In what ways do you all see the change of art media, installations, video, online production, um, influencing the built form of museums? So we had how does how is COVID changing it, which we all don't really know, but how, how do we see the change of art art media influencing? kind of not really my field art media so I'll throw it to someone who might be <laughs> I mean uh, I don't know if this is exactly what the uh, the question is is getting at but one of the things I'm shifting I'm kind of at a pivot point in my uh, research right now moving away from specifically museums and looking at um, basically um, digital technology and its impact on public life in in mm -hmm. cities and so that the connection back to museums for this new area of research is the the influence of Instagram on art museums and, and just museums generally that like um, it's a new it's just a new way that the public experiences museums now is that they go to museums and take pictures of themselves and mm -hmm. um, and you know the, the curators and, and museum uh, administrations are becoming very you know uh, savvy about this that they know if they bring in like um, 
you know, photogenic art, uh, it, there's going to be like a huge, they're going to get huge admission, uh, a jump in admission because it's, it's people are going to see their friends taking a picture of themselves uh, on Instagram and then they're going to go take a picture of themselves. And, and so, yeah, the Art Gallery of Ontario, um, I, I'm just, I think, raised money to buy an infinity room by a uh, Japanese artist whose name escapes me at the moment. But uh, yeah, I think she's been around for a while, but Instagram has like completely like, you know, raised her profile. Yes, one of my students is studying that now and, and doing, you know, a literature review and some research about that. I think that, you know, that it really goes back to the experiential, you know, the, uh, the, the technology, the role of technology in in the live arts. And I think that museums really have been an experiential place, a place where people had to go. And I think that now, uh, you know, the online video production and, and, and some of the technology that's really displacing the places that museums have been, that museums have to be much more involved with social media. They have to be places where, you know, as you said, Matt, people can see and be seen. And, uh, you know, they really serve a different kind of purpose as being a convener, a place where people uh, think that there's a scene going on and, and museums and, and the marketing people and, and building their brand has to, has to involve figuring out how to create a scene and how to sustain it. And, um, I think related to that is that the interiors and, and returning back to the question, I see um, the, the changing of media of, mu of art affecting the interiors of museums most specifically. So I think the exteriors are becoming the spectacular places and conveners. And then the interiors for contemporary museums, I see personally being very, um, needing to be incredibly flexible and um, section offable. That's probably not the real word, but um, that museums, if we have video installations, there needs to be auditory separation between the different galleries frequently. And um, even in museums whose exteriors are in quite spectacular, thinking about the Bilbao um, and even the Denver Art Museum, which has a you know another Liebeskin crystalline form, the the traveling exhibition space inside there, while the wall the exterior walls are are wild and crazy, quite often the interiors are built. the The museum builds these interior walls that are um, you know, white boxes or black boxes really intended to be um, much smaller spaces where the art doesn't compete with the exterior at all, but becomes its own little experience within the museum um, to, to make those auditor oral separations for the videos to make the um, installation of big pieces or small pieces much, much more easy. Um, we have another question here. Um, it said possibly best suited to Matt, but um, question about could the failure of a museum to engage or expand the surrounding built environment be significantly related to the architecture itself? And I think um, Helen would actually be appropriate to ask this one too, and any of you. Um, for example, the, the person asks, Mona in Tasmania is extremely popular for locals and tourists alike, but the largely suburban surroundings have remained quite unchanged <laughs> despite the owner's initial intentions. Um, and the museum itself is quite set back from the street front and this person is wondering how that may be a factor um, rather than just the local economy. Any thoughts on that? Oh, and Helen, since you're here in Tasmania, you might be able to speak to Mona as well. I mean, I think this is the thing that's actually super interesting about Mona is that it's not the specificness of the museum in that place that actually matters, which is sort of different to what Shoshana was saying. So, you know, Mona is in the suburbs on a peninsula, but it's the incredible programming of the city that they do. And when you were just both talking previously about art, I think that Mona has really, for people who don't know, if you just Google Museum of Old and New Art in Tasmania, before the museum opened, they set up a, a summer musical music festival called Monophoma, the Festival of Music and Art. And um, they basically um, developed, like there's an huge tourist, tourism industry 
that just um, comes for the festivals that Mona runs. And going to Mona is a very small part of it. And the, the flip that that institution has made in Tasmania across the whole state has been absolutely incredible. Um, but it's, it's not necessarily about the neighbourhood. So it's a very interesting disjunction in that it is a little weird moat in itself in the middle of a working class suburb. And there's a very odd rub between um, the sort of um, the lack of engagement and, you know, so to some points it can actually, it's a little bit odd, but on the ground, the way that it actually has reshaped the city and the festivals have been constantly using derelict buildings and then the governments or other people have then been going, oh, what a great idea for a building. Why don't we renovate that? So I think there's also roles for museums as cultural curators to show the people how to use the city. And Mona has definitely done that through programming. It's done much more than the things on its physical site. And I think we can get too fixated with the investment in the building and the role of the building. Whereas what we're seeing in the looseness of art practice and culture generally is that I think the buildings are less important than what the, the aspirations and the agenda and the actions of the institutions. Well, I think that speaks to some of the, the uh, conversation that I had about the stakeholders mm -hmm. and you know, in what way the museum is uh, you know, leveraging with the city and city, you know, city owned land or buildings and uh, you know, how they really function as policy entrepreneur in terms of you know, really generating a scene or having a destination in a, a place that's maybe not, you know, a suburban area, which isn't very dense, or in the case of the Royal Ontario Museum, creating a lot of buzz around a building that had, at Matt, had, at, had, as you said, had, had stood for a long time and had a lot of uh, you know, changes made to it, but certainly when when that uh, Michael Lee Chin crystal was created, there was a lot of controversy about it. So I think that, uh, you know, in a dense, more downtown area, that this kind of architecture can be a focal point, and it also can be a, a place that creates demand in you know, in a suburb or even in the countryside, Jade, as, as you showed in your presentation. And I think that, uh, that it's really about the museum, you know, not just the building as you were, you know, we were talking about before, but really how is it, you know, leveraging the demand for, you know, interesting things as well as working together with the municipality to to really meet the goals of of what the city or region is interested in. Great. I think we have time for uh, one quick answer to this last question and then we'll close the event. So um, one final question, given that museums usually have far more material hidden away than they can exhibit at any one time, does a strong narrative and the organization and concept of the building influenced by you know, specific artifacts impede the way a future focus on di a different collection of artifacts might be able to successfully be exhibited. Does anybody want to tackle that in just a couple of sentences? Mm -hmm. I think it's super complex that it's uh, because I guess it's that the, the tricky thing is what the strategy is and how difficult it is to uh, and how expensive it is to constantly refit galleries. And I know that um, places like um, the fabulous museum in Glasgow, um, it, it's that it's sort of really specifically built around it. I, I think that that's the whole challenge. And one of the things about the architecture is really important is how you can take certain parts of the museum out of the loop so that it, it can become more or less easy to be able to refit parts of the museum depending on how it's structured. Because sometimes uh, if you can't take something out and be able to re-kit it without, you know, severely impacting on the rest of the museum, that can be super problematic. But I, I suspect that this is a challenge. Maybe Shoshana, you have more idea being really close to some of these incredible institutions. Uh, well, I do. And I think, Jade, I think you had something that you were going to say. Yeah, um, so there's a museum in, that's that's close to, to home here, the, the Clifford Still Museum that was designed by Allied Works Architects. And um, and so if you know Clifford Still, he was an abstract expressionist and and um, they designed this super uh, beautiful and, and refined 
um, concrete block with the con concrete box with this kind of trellised roof. But the big challenge was we have this museum that's just for this one architect, he, um, sorry, artist, and he had sold almost none of his work in, in his <laughs> lifetime. Um, and, and so I think they are actually able to exhibit maybe like two or 3% of, of his work at any given time. But how do you get the public to continue to come back to, to see the same artist's work? And it's been really amazing. I wanna say that the building opened maybe, maybe about 10 years ago, I, I could be wrong, um, but I've been to a number of exhibits, maybe, maybe 12 or 15, but a number of exhibits there. Um, and they are constantly reinventing, you know, by having only a small percentage of his work on display. Sometimes they're bringing in other artists, but, but usually not. They're usually just, they have this long list of themes that they're constantly sort of rethinking. Um, and, and they've done an incredible job of sort of keeping the local public engaged there. Mm -hmm. Well, I would just comment to, to close that before I became an academic, I was an arts manager and fundraiser and worked in many museums on, uh, on the executive staff raising money. And one of the places was the Natural History Museum in New York City. And I remember, uh, you know, the, the wonderful excitement of having the curators give me a tour of many, many of the different uh, stacks of uh, places where things were stored. And uh, w the way I would relate that is that I don't know if at any of you, we've all been watching a lot of TV, Netflix, uh, but I've been watching The Crown and I watch this part where they, they let people into the palace. So maybe museums need to you know, reconsider uh, bringing people and touring them into the stacks, you know, into the collection that's not on view and you know make that a very special kind of a thing where you can go behind the scenes with the curators and see the way that things are stored and have things pulled out and that that's a great idea and actually some a couple of the um authors who were not in this panel but were in the book talked about that about how to open up the museum stacks and, and you know have the sort of collections the hidden the uh, stored collections be part of the ex exhibition experience, even when they're not fully exhibited. So on that note, we're going to have to end. We are out of time. Um, thank you all so much for attending. Thank you so much to our panelists for their time coming and speaking about museums and how architecture can shake shape experience. Uh, we'll do a couple more of these um, with other authors. There were 18 chapters in this book, so not everyone fit into a single panel. So we'll do a couple more. And um, so if you'd like to receive an email notification about the next couple of panels, you can go ahead and fill out that form that I just popped into the um, chat box. And then also throughout this session, I had um, you know popped more links into the, more information to the speakers into the chat box. And they're all doing really fabulous and fascinating work. And I really encourage all of you to read more about them at their university profiles. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm going to pop my own information into the chat box as well. So you can feel free to get out, get in touch with me. Um, that's a link to my own university profile with contact information um, available there. And then just finally, because this is a celebration of the book and there are other chapters available as well. I'm going to one more time pop in the um, pop in the discount code so you get 20% off if you go buy the book through Routledge or look for it at your local library. Many libraries bought it and you can probably find it there. Um, so thank you to everyone. Thank you all for joining around the world. Have a lovely evening or afternoon or morning or wherever you are. Thank you. Georgia. Thank you. Bye. Bye.